My name is Cindy Ensminger, and I've been a part of First Temple for almost two years. It'll be two years February. I had been searching for a church for several months, and uh, a coworker invited me to First Temple. I didn't miss a Sunday for a long time. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I have always suffered from depression and anxiety uh, ever since that I can remember. Uh, I never felt like I had the self-confidence or I was not worthy of God's love. So I must have rededicated my life a dozen times growing up as a kid because I, I did not feel like I was worthy of being loved. As I was sitting in worship service one time, I never understood what it meant to give everything to God. To Give him your burdens. Give him your things that worried you. And it just so happened that during that service, it was on trusting God. At that moment, I said, God, I'm not sure how to do this, but I just want to trust you with everything. I give everything to you. And I felt like there was such a burden lifted off my shoulders. And since then, I have found the joy, the love, the hope, the peace that I never even knew existed. Loving God and growing in my faith gave me the self-confidence that I never had. God helped me see that he would be always with me, and that whatever I did, He would be there. That's what gave me the self-confidence to go and teach the class, go by myself and go to a Bible study, and be a greeter at the front desk. I can't tell you the love that I feel when I'm greeting from the people here at First Baptist. There's such a love that comes from this church. And I am so blessed that I was able to be led here by God. Amen. Sometimes you hear somebody's story and you're like, how am I supposed to follow that? Oh, Miss Cindy, thank you. Good morning, my name's Evan. I'm the teaching pastor here. Uh, we're glad that you have joined us for this awesome day where we're dedicating kids and we're going to take communion together. Hey, if you're watching online as well, thank you for joining us. So if you did not grab an, the elements for communion, they're in the back by the front door if you want to grab those. If you're watching online, grab what you got at home. You can totally participate. We'd love for you to participate as well with us in communion. This is the final wrap-up week of this series that we've been working through on the book of Deuteronomy. And we're studying the book of Deuteronomy and some things that come out of Deuteronomy because, because I, I don't know, it's been, it's been a journey these last few months. And as we've gone through all kinds of things and there's been all kinds of stuff in our world that we've been dealing with, we thought it was a good time, a right time, to remember who God is and what God has called us to as a church family. And so we have decided that we were going to look at Deuteronomy and talk about the mission that God has given this church and we believe we are to participate in together. We do that by looking at Deuteronomy, which is this incredible part of the story of the people of God. See, God had said, I want you to be my people. And, and then what happened with the people of Israel, they ended up in Egypt and they end up in slavery. And so they're enslaved and they cry out to God. And the text says God heard their cry and came and rescued them, set them free from slavery. And then they come out of Egypt and God says, I have a place for you, a land for you. Follow me. So they're following God. And as they're doing that, God is going to speak to them. And he's going to give them commands and show them who he is and things like the Ten Commandments. That's where that comes from. God's saying, here's what it's going to look like to be my people, how you will live in the place that you're going. People are like, this sounds awesome. And then they get to the land that they're supposed to go in and it looks scary. <laughs> and things look hard and they get nervous and they get cold feet. And God says, cool, 
and try again in 40 years. So 40 years pass, and a whole new generation of people come up wandering in the wilderness, and now it's finally time to enter in the land that God has prepared for his people. In the book of Deuteronomy, is Moses, their leader, giving a series of speeches about what they need to know, how they can recommit before they enter in the land that God has promised them. It's not anything new. It's these commands and this call that God has already given his people. And it's a restatement, a recommitment, a redo as they enter into that land. Now, when I was like dating, and this will... uh, uh, reveal if you're part of my generation or not. When I was dating, uh, we had this thing that we called a, a DTR, define the relationship. And what that means is if you were like, I don't know, starting to like somebody, maybe hung out, you guys were like talking, you would need to have this thing, this DTR, a conversation where you define the relationship. And usually it began by somebody saying, we need to talk. Right? And you'd be like, oh no, we need to talk. And then we would define the relationship. And the whole point was to say like, do you like me? Do I like you? Where is this going? What is the nature of our relationship? And what is next? Do we like want to be a couple? Or did I, did I talk too much about Star Wars on the first date again? Maybe that applies to me. I don't know about to y'all. We would have these DTR. The book of Deuteronomy is an opportunity for us to, to, to take a second and define our relationship with God, with each other. And what is the nature of our relationship with God? What is the nature of our relationship with each other? And where are we going? Here at First Temple, we have a mission statement that we're really passionate about. Uh, It's on the screen here. Uh, It's leading those far from God to encounter him and grow in the ways of Christ. That's our mission. And all that is, we've taken some of the commands of Jesus, like go into all the nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, make disciples. These commands that Jesus has given us, we've taken these and kind of put our spin on the language about how we want to engage with our world. We want to lead those far from God. That is, as we're seeking to grow closer to Christ and encounter and know God, we want to bring people with us to invite them to engage in what God is doing, and then together we want to grow in the ways of Christ. That's our mission. And there are lots of other missions or desires or things that are pulling us in our culture around us. We want to take this time to focus on what is our mission together as a body of believers. God has given us an incredible opportunity to participate in what he is doing in the world. Right? That's wild. The God of the universe doing incredible things in the world and invites us to be a part. And here at First Temple, we're in this space, this location. I don't know if you've driven around these neighborhoods right around here. You may have gotten nails in your tires because of how much construction is happening. There are people coming from all over right here. God has placed us here. What will we do about it? This is our mission. We say that we're going to do this mission with the three C's. Put them on the screen. They are commune with God. We've talked about these throughout this series, that we will connect, commune with God through regular attendance and active participation in worship together and in our own spiritual disciplines. That means we're going to seek after and encounter God in our own lives and also as we gather together as a community of believers. We want to actually gather together. And and, and that's not just so that we could have all the chairs full. Like That's not the intent. The intent is so that we can encourage one another and grow together and encounter together so that when somebody like Miss Cindy comes into this building looking for hope and for answers and for community, she finds people seeking after God to love her and encourage her and connect with her. We want to commune with God together. We say we want to cultivate our faith by having teachable spirit, an appetite for spiritual growth, participating together in in life groups, our small groups, and other Bible study opportunities. We want to discover, develop, demonstrate, duplicate our spiritual gifts, skills, and abilities by serving in the ministries and programs of the church. We want to get plugged in and ask God to use us, our gifts and our passions, and the way he made us to make an impact. We say we want to demonstrate a generous spirit by actively participating in regular, even systematic financial contributions to the church's budgets and special offerings, because we live in a world that says money is God, and we want to say, nah, (laughs) 
Jesus is Lord, and I will not let money be the final thing. We will develop generosity together. We say we want to collide with culture. We will actively share our faith as God gives us opportunities with those he puts in our path, in our own community, across the globe. As we seek to follow Jesus and walk in his ways and learn to love like he loves, we will just run into a world that is confused by this kind of radical love. And we will point to Jesus all the way. Today, we're going to talk about making this commitment together. And we've got a little card that we'll talk through in a little bit. But if you're a guest or a first timer, or you're just checking out First Temple, you may be like, what the heck? <laughs> I showed up and y'all are doing this like renewing our commitment and I've never renewed my commitment, so I don't know why we're doing this. I get it. All of these things are things that just come out of Scripture or how we respond to the God that rescues us. And so whether that's in this body of believers or another body of believers, we want to encourage you to ask the question, what's the nature of my relationship with God and others, and what do I do about it? Right, those are the questions we're asking, and we can answer that together as a family. You can answer that with another expression of God's believers, but we want to answer that question together, and I want to challenge you to wrestle with that question. So as we think about that, of what's the nature of our relationship, how are we going to move forward? Are we going to commit to these kinds of things that, that are the DNA of First Temple? We're going to look at Deuteronomy. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 29. We'll be in verses 9 through 14. This is Deuteronomy 29, 9 through, actually go to 15. Moses is speaking to the people as they're finally about to enter into the land. They're making this recommitment before they go in. And here's what Moses says. Therefore, diligently observe the words of this covenant in order that you may succeed in everything that you do. Okay, we're going to unpack verse 9 a little bit later, but let's keep reading. You stand assembled today, all of you, before the Lord your God. The leaders of your tribes, your elders, your officials, all the men of Israel, your children, your women, the aliens who are in your camp, both those who cut your wood and those who draw your water, to enter into the covenant, the promise of the Lord your God, sworn by an oath, which the Lord your God is making with you today. Let's pause for a second, because we read that and we're like, okay, that sounds cool. But in the ancient world, the idea that the God of the universe would choose to make an agreement, a promise, a connection with just regular old people is wild, <laughs> right? And this is the story of Christianity that Jesus, God, would come, God in flesh, to know you and love you and rescue you. It is a wild idea that God cares that much about you. And then in the ancient world, if there was a promise to be made, you would make it with the leaders and the elders, the officials, but the list doesn't stop there. In verse 11, it says, and your children, your women, the foreigners in your camp, right? Everybody in the ancient world, these people would have had no power. And God says they're part of the promise too. And so this idea of like human dignity for all people, this beautiful idea has come out of the Jewish and Christian faith into our culture. This is where it comes from, this boundary-breaking idea that God cares about everybody. Verse 13, in order that you may establish today as his people, and he may be your God, as he promised to you and swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, I am making this covenant, this promise, sworn by an oath, not only with you who stand here with us today before the Lord your God, but also with those who are not here with us today, even those going forward in the future. What is the nature of our relationship to God? And we see it here in verse 13, that we might be his people, and he might be our God. God has committed to us first to be his people. I realize this is a text written in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel, but this is a promise that goes and then is expanded to everybody who follows Jesus. We are welcomed into the family. God sought you out and says, hey, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. 
I want to be the one who you give everything to. Or what did Miss Cindy say? I, I didn't know that I could give God my burden, these things that I was carrying, these negative things she had thought about herself. She could give them to God, and he could be in control. I want you to be my people, and I'll be your God. I want to go back to verse 9, unpack that a little bit. So if that's the nature of our relationship, that God would be our God and we might be his people, what do we do? What's next? How do we live that out? Well, 29.9 told us, it said, Therefore, diligently observe the words of this covenant in order that you may succeed in everything that you do. Okay, we've got to unpack that a little bit. But what does it mean to diligently observe? Those words literally mean to keep and to do. To hold on and to act. So when we think about covenant promises, you, you might first think about like marriage. Right? Those are vows. That's a covenant that we make today. And in our marriage vows, there's the same kind of idea of to keep and to do. There are some things we keep. right? Like we say, I will be faithful to my spouse. I will restrain myself and be faithful only to my spouse. Something that we keep. Right? But if that was the totality of your marriage, right? whoop de doo you guys could do that in separate rooms across the globe. There's also something that we do together, that we are living together. You also seek to love one another, to care for one another, to prioritize the other, to seek the best for your spouse. We keep and we do. Moses says you keep these commands together for God, and you also actively seek God, love God, cultivate faith, commune, collide, we act on it. And then it says in verse 9, in order that you may succeed in everything that you do. Now, I'll admit, when we talked about preaching through Deuteronomy, I was like, Ugh, Deuteronomy can get a little sticky sometimes. Because sometimes people take Deuteronomy and they think it means if I just follow all the rules, God will give me all the good stuff. If I just do all the right things, God will give me that bass boat that's just been sitting on my wish list and I really want that bass boat, right? Some people take Deuteronomy and think that's what it means. Or they take it and say, oh, I think it means if I do good, good things happen to me. And if I do bad, bad things happen to me. And I guess if bad things happen to somebody, they must have been bad. Right? That's what people sometimes take and twist Deuteronomy. They think that's what it means. But that's not at all what we see here and not at all what we see as Jesus teaches us about what it means to be a Christian. That word success means to deal wisely, to live well in the world. And, and that word success, we see that word success, we get excited because we know what success means in our world and our culture. It means more stuff and more titles right? means more income and a better retirement account, right? That's what success means. But in God's economy, <laughs> that's not what success means. When Jesus talks about what it means to follow him, success looks very different. We read this text and we think, okay, they're going to enter into this land. Well, what does that mean for us as Christians? Well, as Christians today, we're not, we're not occupying a land. No way. Instead, we're invited to participate in God's kingdom. Jesus says, my kingdom is among you. The kingdom is at hand. That is anywhere where God is in control, where he rules and reigns in our lives. To enter into God's kingdom and participate in his kingdom is to turn to Jesus, repent, ask him to be our savior, to let him be in charge. Take our crown off and kneel at his throne to surrender everything to him, like Miss Cindy talked about. And in Jesus' kingdom, his upside-down kingdom, success looks different. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He said, the last will be first. I played sports in high school. The last was never first. <laughs> Jesus' kingdom is flipping this idea of success completely on its head. So we commit and we follow God and we devote ourselves to his ways and we have success. And that success is we are part of what God is doing in the world. We are investing in things that will last forever when the things of this world will end in a generation. 
It means we participate in what God is doing around us to change the world, to help make the world right. We participate in God's radical love. We find purpose and joy and peace that passes understanding. It's Miss Cindy's story again and again what she found. That's success. And that's what we're invited to participate in. Throughout the scriptures, there's this idea that we might remember, we might renew, we might think back to who God is and what God has done for us because, because we can forget. We can get distracted. We can be influenced by all these missions out there and, and just want to do what the world says we're supposed to do, all these things within us. We're like, that's my goal, actually. We must be reminded of God's mission for us. And so we wanted to challenge each other, church family. In the back of the seats, there's this card, Renewing Our Mission. And all it is is our mission statement in those three C's that we talked about. And whenever you join the church at First Temple, you go to a workshop and we have these cards and you fill it out and you commit and say, this is what uh, I'm committing to as a member of this church family. And we thought it would be good and right for us to take some time to commit again. Now, I'll give some caveats on this here. Uh, I realize there's a lot here and it's a big thing to commit and, and be serious about something like this. So we're not necessarily asking you to fill this out today. You can. We've got boxes over there where you can drop it off. It's also available online. You can fill it out there. But we want to challenge you to pray about filling this out by January. That's it. By January, just think, is this something that I want to commit to? If you're already a member and you don't turn this in, you don't lose your membership. Don't worry. If you're not a member and you fill this out, you don't automatically become a member. This is just an opportunity for you as a spiritual exercise and as a communal exercise to us to say, yeah, oh yeah, this church thing, this commitment to God thing, I'm in. Let's do it. And so we want you to take this card, to pray about it, to wrestle with it. Maybe you've been a member here 70 years. <laughs> Maybe you've been a member here two months. Maybe you're not a member at all. Wrestle with these things. As you ask the question, what is the nature of the relationship that I have with God, that I have with others? What is God calling me to do about it? So I want to challenge you to take this card or go to our website, forsimple.org slash commit. You can find it there. It's on our app too. Fill this out. Think about it. Pray about it. As I think about what it means to commit and follow God, I, I thought about Miss Cindy's story. I thought about the story of a church member his name's Sam. Uh, he told me that I can tell this story, and, and half the time he attends this service. The other half the time he's playing violin in the classic service. Sam's been a member here a long time, and when he was in college, he joined, and, and he feels a real call to go overseas and be a missionary. So he spent his college years preparing so that he might be able to take business skills overseas and use that, uh, use that degree for mission work. And towards the end of his college experience, he got accepted into a program where he would go and spend three months in North Africa with a people group who had never heard Jesus' name before. It was wild. He had to take like a camel to get there. It was so cool. And he was so excited about this opportunity, and as we got closer to the day where he was going to go, um, his father was diagnosed with cancer. Sam's the oldest of nine. Okay, I know, nine. Um, and and it just a few weeks before he was supposed to go, um, his father passed away. And I sat with Sam, and he was, and we grieved together, and we prayed together, and he had to answer this question of like, okay, do I go? <laughs> do I go and do this thing that I feel called to do? Or not. I don't know. He ended up going. It was an incredible experience. And we talked about it when he came home. And he said, you know, I was pretty angry. I had a lot of question marks. And I just realized I either had to be all in with God. I just say, you know what, God? I'm going. Wherever you say, yes, I'm going. Because I'm really going to believe that you defeat death and cancer, and evil, and sin, and the sin within me, and the sin in the world. I'm really going to believe that you do that, and I'm going to live like it, or I have to walk away. There's nothing in the middle for me. 
And as he prayed about that and he wrestled with it, even as he wrestled with it with his dad before his dad passed, he knew that God was saying, I'm with you. You're my people. I'm your God. Death can't win. Sin won't win. I have you here for a purpose and a reason. And I have plans for you and hopes for you. So go. And he went. He went. He went because he was responding to the God who went all in for him. Jesus goes all in for us. I don't think there's a better way to finish this series than by taking communion together. So when you came in, you should have received their two cups stacked together. That's how we do this now uh, in the pandemic reality. So I hope you grabbed when you came in. If you didn't, you can go grab some. The bottom is the bread. The top is the juice. And as we think about this commitment that, that God has made for us first and then how we respond to it, I have to think of this action of remembrance that Jesus gives us. I tell you about communion here at First Temple. Maybe you've never taken communion with us. Let me say, um, this is not our table. It's God's table. So you don't have to be a Baptist or a member of our church to take communion here. This is for anyone who confesses that Jesus is Lord, declared that he's their Savior, asked for forgiveness and is walking in the Christian life with Jesus. You get to take this. This is for you. I'm going to read some of the passages, and we'll pray together, and we'll take these. But I want us to reflect. Luke 22, starting in verse 19, Jesus took a loaf of bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we remember, I want you to think about this commitment that God has shown for you, what the lengths that God has gone for you. That Jesus would lay down his life for you and take some time and tell him thank you. Confess to him the ways that you have not always listened or left things undone or done things you shouldn't. And tell him thanks. Take a moment and pray. Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ. Take and eat. You take the lid off your cup. I want you to take a moment. And ask this question, Lord, what's the nature of our relationship and what's next? Take a moment and reflect. did the same with the cup after supper, saying this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. These are the lengths that he would go to for you. The body of Christ shed, the blood of Christ shed for you, take, drink. Everybody clip, this is the fun part. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for this church family. These you've gathered in this room at this time, at this place. And as we wrestle with what it means to follow you and what that means in our world at this time, may we remember that you are our God and we are your people. 
May we remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us. And maybe for the first time, we need to confess that you are Lord and ask you to be the Lord of our life, to give you our burden, to give you our sin, to ask for your forgiveness, to make you king of our lives. And for those of us who've been following you a long time, Lord, may you continue to challenge us. May we commit today to seek after you, to grow in your way. May you show us what is next. And God, by the power of your spirit, may you make us more like you. And may you use these people to impact your work. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.